Hey, Amy. Yeah, Juan. Give me that beat. It's Baseball Shangri-La with Amy Cuevas and Juan Ramirez. What's up, party people? She is Amy Cuevas. I am Juan Ramirez. You are listening or watching Baseball Shangri-La. If you are listening to us on the audio portion of the podcast, please make sure you are subscribed to our podcast. Rate us, write us a review, uh, help spread the word. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. Hit that notification button. Give us a thumbs up. Leave us comments. We love engaging with you guys. And most importantly, Make sure you are following us on social media on X at BB Shangri LA, on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch at Baseball Shangri LA. Amy, uh, I have to be honest with you. I feel like I started that episode a little off. And that's because on our last episode, I wasn't wearing headphones. And now I'm wearing headphones again. And I feel. I don't know if you've ever seen that character Will Ferrell does where he has a very loud voice and he can't control the sound of his of his voice. Anyways, wh- this is just a long way of me saying I feel like it was a little off when I said give me that com- beat. Do you feel complete now, though, now that you have your audio crown? No, not not really. I just I feel completely mm-hmm. off a little bit like I I feel like that. Give me the beat came off a little aggressive and, and angry. Oh, oh and- there was some oomph behind it. You want to say it again? Say it one more time. No, no, it's okay. I'll save it for the next episode, but I just want to acknowledge <laughs> I'm not mad at you people. I'm not mad at you. It I thought just, you were just fueled by the the oomph from that Yankees win, that Yankees series win. So I was going with No, I, I was just, I'm just completely thrown off by wearing my headphones again. So I am uh, yeah. a creature of habit. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess, hey, welcome to OCD, everybody. So oh, hey, everybody... We've, we've, we've got all the neurodivergence here on this show. So, you know. We've just got we've got the whole melee. Um, I will say this. There was no base running blunder that we know of at this point while we're recording from the last episode because one helped me dial that back. So Jose Ayala, I I dialed it back. I took back my stat that I wasn't 100 percent sure on. If there's something else, we'll we'll definitely catch that. But she rescinded. Sure you no. Know. <laughs> she rescinded so it doesn't count so uh, we're actually going to cover a lot of stuff in this show so let's get right to it let's first uh for those of you who who listen to this show or are regulars you know we'd like to update you on past stories that we covered so amy let's go uh with uh our latest updates uh, so the last time we were recording, um, at the time of that recording, uh, I, I, you're going to have to help me with his name, Tucupita uh, Marcano, was under investigation. And then as we dropped our next episode, it, it was released, but we had already recorded that he actually was banned from baseball. Um, he has a, a ban for life for violating the league's gambling policy. And then the four other players in, in the minor leagues right now that, that were under investigation were also suspended. So A's right-handed pitcher, Michael Kelly, Padres left-handed pitcher, Jay Groom, uh, Phillies infielder, Jose uh, Rodriguez, and then Diamondbacks left-handed pitcher, um, Andrew Salfrank. So um, just wanted to make sure we, we closed the loop on that, that story. So he has been banned for life. Which is very interesting, right? Because I feel like this story, when it broke, got some traction. But ever since then, I have heard nothing about it. And I don't know if it's because Tucupita Marcano is not Shohei Otani. It is not a a, a big name. Or if it's just the fact that Major League Baseball is very interested in having this story go away. And they don't want it lingering because, as we mentioned before... There seems to be quite a few stories about gambling going around in Major League Baseball. And as Amy has said before on this show, it's not just Major League Baseball. It's all all over sports. And those four players, just to be clear, they only got a one year band where where Marcano is. He's out. So that's um, it. Yeah. Closing the loop on that one. And, And I know we left you guys all on a cliffhanger last episode. That's right. We we left on a cliffhanger. We didn't get a chance to get into these on-field interviews that have been going on for a while. So, Amy, I want to turn to you. The floor is yours, madam. What upset you about the on-the-field interviews this past weekend? So, so for me, I guess it's just it feels like the players are distracted and divided attention. And I know that they'll never say it because they're professionals. But we got to see it initially Friday with with Kike being mic'd up at, at third base and like. I was, 
I don't, I try not to get too negative, but I was texting my best friend in that moment before I was like, you know what? I'm just going to FaceTime her because like they were asking him questions like about the colors of his shoes. And then mid play, he ends up making an error. He gets hit in the junk with a ball that gets bobbled and then has to like try to make the play. And then everybody is awkwardly quiet because it's like, okay, he, he just made an error like crap. And then after a few minutes, he's like, so before I made the error, you know, like, what were you guys asking? Because he was having trouble hearing them. It was so loud in Yankee Stadium that he constantly, like, if you watch the game or if you watch, like, a repeat of the game, he's asking them to repeat themselves over and over again. And that that was kind of the the trend over the weekend. You'd see Teoscar asking, you know, he had his glove over his ear. Like, they couldn't hear these guys while they're on the field. Same thing with um, Verdugo on on the Yankees. So I'm just, like... Dave Roberts came out and he did say like, you know, he's not a fan, but he's, it's part of the game now. And, you know, Kike saying he'll like, he'll do it if, if he's asked to, uh, I didn't know these players do get paid every time they do it. So it was alluded to in an article, I believe in the, the Orange County register that he gets, they get paid $10,000 every time they do one of these. So I think it was Bill Plunkett who reported that. So players are paid 10,000 for their participation in the mic'd up interviews. Uh, at the time, Robert hadn't talked to Ike about it, but you know, he's he said, I know he likes the limelight. He's into the social media thing. He still plays hard, practices hard, but he still likes to build his brand. So I get it. I'm okay with it. He plays his butt off, but it's just like that awkward moment of like, oh God, he just made this error, and then you know, they're just like, oh well, we'll just uh, we'll just stay quiet while you play third base, and then you can hear them talking amongst themselves. So. I immediately go to like, if I'm a player, yeah, I want to get that 10 grand. But at the same time, like I got pitch common one year, I got you guys talking about the game in the other ear and I'm trying to keep focused on the game. I'm just like, as, as one of the players on my quote unquote team, like I want him focused on the Yankees right now. I don't want him focused on an interview. I don't know. How do how do you feel about it? Is it just, are you ambivalent? No, I, I I agree with everything that everybody said. Uh, I am not a fan of these. Uh, I know that there are people who feel that it is a value add. I I don't see it um, because there isn't anything, I think, new or groundbreaking that is said in these things. I, like for me, like go ahead and interview the people in the dugout. I, I think those interviews are fine. But, but don't on- block out the game either, which sometimes happens. Because now I'm missing the game on the TV, and I don't even know what plays being made. Then I have an empty scorecard. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> it's like, why do we need to interview them during the game? Why can't I mean that's the reason why we have post game interviews, right? Uh, I, I, for me, I, this this past weekend, it seems like it stood out a lot more because, especially on the Apple broadcast, because Geeka seemed to have the longest cord for his earpiece like it Mm -hmm. cracks me up because it was like not secret service like it like it was it was big and i think it went to like a pack on his back or something like that like because there were people commenting on social media i I mean it took me back to the radio shack days where i'm like (laughs) what are we what are we doing here but for me i think the biggest thing that came out of that was after he made that I, i mean the interview and then he made the air was you know that ball went off his balls it, mm-hmm. it looked like That's it what I mean. he got hit in the junk like he got and hit now, in the junk. now he's like you can't even react because you're on like oh like what are you gonna do well in the post game jerry hairston said that geek had told him he doesn't wear a cup like to me you gotta be insane to play third base and not he's in wear the a hot cup. corner sans cup like well and yeah. some of the questions they're asking like they're asking about how yamamoto's acclimating and like he's like well, you know, he is taking English classes three times a week off the field. Like, this is the stuff we need to hear in the middle of the Yankees series. And then the error that gets the guy on the field ends up coming to third base. The The player is standing next to Kike and they're still asking him questions. And I'm like, this is so awkward. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan of him. I am curious if you... Because I don't normally watch Sunday night baseball. I will only watch it if if it's the Dodgers. Uh, I don't watch Apple games unless it's the Dodgers. So basically what I'm telling you guys is I don't watch any other baseball unless it's the Dodgers. So I am curious if anybody has the numbers uh, up until this point in the year. How many plays have been impacted by these on-field interviews? Well, it and happened it again is- with Verdugo on Sunday. 
he was yeah. mic'd up and the Theo hit a ball out to him while he's like mid conversation. I think, I think his earpiece may have even flew out at one point. I'm not sure. It looked like he lost whatever was on, like he had the mic on, but I don't know if he lost the earpiece. Theo was, he was mic'd up and he was mic'd up while Cabrera, uh, Cabrera hit that home run. Like I just, why? I, I'm I'm worried because what is it going to take where a player gets injured, and I hope that that doesn't happen, that now we we reevaluate it? Like, is this for the casuals that we're trying to get more people into baseball? Because the consensus, at least on social media and amongst the people that I know, is what are we doing? Yes. Uh, I think the most positive response that I've gotten to these interviews has been eh, to the majority of the people saying they don't like them. So I don't know who these TV partners, I don't know whose opinion they value the most. Maybe the younger kids, maybe the younger kids love this. Maybe they love the access, but it is one of those things where it, it is a turnoff. It's almost as much as, you know, when announcers talk too much. Where it's I don't like, want my guys distracted during the game. I don't want them thinking about what they're going to say to you, listening to you and trying to focus on the plays. I don't want them anything taking them out of the game even in the dugout if you're gonna do it i guess do it there but if you're think, but like if you think about that too these guys are zoned in and now you got to take them out to do like whatever like i get it the only positive i can think of the whole thing is that they get paid 10 grand for this good which, good for which, you guys get paid but like that's the only positive that's it make that money i did not know that Neither they uh that they got paid. Uh, that's that, that's crazy to me. Uh, okay, next uh, next topic that we want to touch base is on. And there's a couple of stories that had come out. And this, I think this one at least was a couple of weeks ago, I think was the Matt Kemp one. Uh, Matt Kemp was interviewed, I believe it was by Ryan Clark. And this is and on the heels of us talking about Jorge Lopez. And, you know, he's he got DFA'd for either flinging his glove or the comments that were mistaken in that interview and he has those those pending personal things going on that impacted his mental health and he took a, a break off the previous year for mental health as well so it's all kind of ties together and and i have an update for you on the jorge uh, lopez uh, story Ooh. i was able to talk to espn's uh, jorge castillo who is based out of new york and covers both the yankees and the mets and he, he was actually there during uh, that that interview and he had told me that there were two Mets PR people in the clubhouse while this was happening. And the Mets translator was in the clubhouse while this was happening. Uh, one of the things, and I want to tip my hat to Jorge Castillo because uh, I, it's, I think it, it's very big of him because he did say that he felt conflicted. He felt like he should have maybe stepped in and said something because he thought it was clear that uh, Jorge Lopez did not understand the question. But and and this is why I admire Jorge Castillo as a journalist. And that is he doesn't get paid by the Mets. And I don't think it's his job, especially with the fact that the Mets had two PR people and they had a an interpreter in there and they didn't see fit to to enter to intervene um so i mean it is disappointing and i think again, it was a perfect storm of crud <laughs> yeah it, it's a little more it, it's a little more complicated uh than we thought because again he did they did give him an opportunity to clarify what he said but hmm. look it doesn't look like he was in a in a good headspace and when you're not in a good headspace like that i don't know that and if he thought he understood though, and it's clear they both weren't understanding each other, like at that point, like it, it behooves the people involved, everybody. Hey, we need to we need to pull somebody in because, like I said, I've been in those situations, whether it's sign language or you know, I'm still trying to learn Spanish because I didn't get the benefit of learning it when I was little. Like there are times where like you'll say something and I'm like, Can you repeat that? Because I don't understand, or like, uh-huh, yeah, I got what Com you said. Como se dice candy? Um, so we'll say. so Matt Kemp did an interview with Ryan Clark and Matt Kemp was very candid in terms of his time with the, the show pods. Um, you, do you have, to, do you have like direct quotes? I, I mean, I mean, oh, you know, I do. <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll let you go with the quotes and then I'll, I'll, I'll give my two cents. 
Okay. So he said, when you retire, it's kind of like a death in your family. He said there was a depression there for three to four years where I was like, I can't say goodbye yet. And so like, he was basically saying that he was happiest when he was on the field and he felt this void in his life, which I'm sure he's not the only baseball player that feels that because of that routine that they go with. So go on with you all. No. Do you have any more that you want to um, go, go through all the quotes and then we can. I'm just trying to see. Um, yeah, basically. Yeah. Th those were the ones that, that he was saying on there. Um, he just related to guys who talk about their experience with retirement, how it feels like death and coping with letting go of the game. That means so much to you can be hard. And it, it is a personal struggle. And, and a lot of people don't talk about it, or at least if they are, it's not being made public. So um, he kind of brought that conversation to, to the forefront. What I found really interesting was he he had talked about the impact of being traded from the Doyers to the show pods. And it's so funny to me because he had mentioned about the level of accountability in Los Angeles. And usually Los Angeles is not considered. It's not like New York. It's not like Boston, where you have the media constantly on top of you questioning, well, why would you do this? Why would you do that? There is a different level of accountability on from the East Coast media. And I don't think that the L.A. media has as bad a reputation. Yes, we have guys like Dylan Hernandez. And I didn't get a chance to say this in a, in a past episode, but T.J. Simers recently uh, passed away of a columnist for the Los Angeles Times who was notorious known for for I don't want to say confront confronting players, but asking people the tough questions that need to be asked questions that sometimes are uncomfortable. So those are the kind of guys that you say they make things a little uncomfortable for athletes, but LA doesn't have that. Well, and I well, think there's a fine line on that too. So it just, I think it depends on the context, but yeah. So, but I thought it was really interesting that he said that when he went to San Diego and he no longer had that, that it really impacted him as well. And I don't know if it was because he left a winning organization, a team that was, you know, going to be in the playoffs and then went to the Padres. I think we lose sight of that a lot that we think, well, these guys are getting paid. That's all they care about. And we never really believe it when they say, oh, they, they, all they care about is, is winning. We're like, no, they don't. They, they, they want, they don't play for free. They, they, but it's interesting. Once you get on a team and you realize we suck, we're never going to get to the playoffs. How that can impact your, your mood, your 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 mental health. But I think that's why I take the stance I take because not everybody gets to play on the Dodgers, and and that that's two sided. You play on the Dodgers, you've got a whole lot of responsibility and expectations on your back. But you leave that, and you're not with it. Like like Kemp is saying, like. It, that's hard to to go away from, which is where I think the humanity of the game is so important is not all of these guys have a choice in where they go. They just get sent. And, and I think that that's where we need to give these guys some grace. Like, I don't know, I don't know what changed in the last like 10 or so years. It feels like that, that all, it feels like all we do is we tear these guys down and it's like, where's the enjoyment and where is, is, us respecting the humanity of how hard these guys work in this game and just enjoying the game for what it is versus us all playing couch manager and, you know, well, we could have done it better than this. Well, yeah, we could have done it 10 different ways, but in the split second that they had to make this decision, manager, player, defender, whatever, this is how it shook out. This is what we got. So are we going to enjoy it or are we not? And are we going to give these guys some grace? You know, again, it's fascinating to me because Look, you and I both, I don't think by any means, consider ourselves stars or popular or deserving of any attention. But I will say this. We're just two people who like to talk baseball. <laughs> exactly. But sometimes, not sometimes, I catch a lot of strays on social media from people that I have no clue who they are. And I, I look at It doesn't at them feel good, I, does it? Right. You sit there and you go, wait a but minute. We what? do this to players every day. And that's exactly. okay. Exactly. That, that, and Hold it's on, like, let me shove my soapbox away. <laughs> and I sit there and I go, wow, why, why am I letting something like this affect me? And you, you nailed it, Amy. 
it's like, if I feel this way, how is it that a player who has millions of followers, you know, and is hearing, like, let's put it out there. Chris Taylor has not openly discussed the mental struggles that he's probably going through this year. But you know, you look at him when he gets interviewed, the way he sounds, you know that that is affecting him. The fact that he is having a horrible season and the fact that I am, look, I'm sure he, he doesn't actively seek this out, but he is aware of the fact that everybody talks smack on him. He is aware that everybody's like, get rid of him, get rid of him, get rid of him. And you still kind of show up to work. Mm -hmm. And then the, the few opportunities that you get to perform, that's even more pressure that you have to perform. And I, I don't no know. No wonder these guys get the yips. Like, cause there's, there's two, there's two sides of that too. Right. There's, there's the stats of like, man, I wish this, this, this stat, let's just say the stat will take the person out because Taylor's caught strays. Barnes caught strays last year, but like, man, these stats are not where we think a professional on this team should be. But you've also got the person on the other side of that that you know is not sitting any of this out. They are trying their hardest. They are going into every at bat. They're doing the prep before the game. And so we got to reconcile the two. And it's like, can we be frustrated with the stat? Yeah, I bet they are too. But like, how do we also support that guy because he's on our team? And, you know, at, at what point, like, how do we reconcile that? Like, because there is the clamor of, do we trade him? Do we get rid of him? You know, we've all had those thoughts, but also like, okay, how much grace do we give them to hopefully figure it out? But also we are, any team is looking to win. So like, how do you balance that? Like, that's, I don't even know how you do that. And then everybody's got to deal with the pressure besides. Yeah. And I know that that's not interesting to people. I know that there's a lot of people out there who don't care about this stuff. All they care about is they want their team to win. All they care about is they want them to hit home runs. Um, and I don't know if it's because of the fact that we cover this team, that we're there in the clubhouse. I, I, I like, again, I can't stress enough to you guys. These guys know their numbers. Mm -hmm. They know what, what their production is. And I remember last year, being like I was in the dugout and I heard Austin Barnes make a comment and it was half of a joke, but Austin Barnes making a comment is like, well, I'm not having the greatest season. And, and it's just like one of those things where he plays it off as a joke. But to me, you read the subtext on that and, and it it's bothering him. And that's that the, I'm going to make the joke it. first. So you can't make it back at me. Yes. Like, I'm going to, uh -huh. I'm going to take that target off my back and I'm going to hold it up. I know you're still going to hit me, but I like, I just, I don't know where we balance that mental health piece. I feel like, so there was another story that came up with Chris Martin, who pitched for the Dodgers and is now pitching for the Red Sox. Um, he just got put on the 15 day uh, injured list retroactive to May 30th for anxiety. And like, that's not something that we hear of, but if that's what he needs to get back in the game, I applaud his willingness to seek help. There was a, an interview with Alex Cora where somebody asked him about, you know, what does this look like? And he said, Chris Martin seeking help differed from his own experience. His family suffered. He suffered when he was going through it, when he was a player. And of, of Martin, he said, he's going to be okay whenever he's ready, right? We don't know if it's short-term, long-term. We never know. We don't know about this, but I think the team that's around, it's going to surround him and he's going to be okay. And like, what a contrast that we've come to finally, where, at you know, we would never hear about this stuff. Like guys, just, you just take it on the chin you get out, you get back out there. Like, kind of like what Alex Cora was talking about with his experience and his personal life. He personally suffered from that. And kind of going back to what you were talking about with Kemp, like this game is, is bigger than all of us. And these guys live it every day. This is their day in, day out. Um, the Kershaw book that I was reading uh, talked about like, that's one of the questions he has to answer. He has this strict routine. What is he going to do when he eventually retires and doesn't have that? How do you acclimate to a life? I, I'm not, I don't want to equate it to what the military goes through. So I don't mean any disrespect, but when you are in any kind of profession where this is your everything, and then you go back to essentially like a civilian style life, how do you acclimate to that? And, and what do we have to bridge that gap? 
look, it's it's common. It's what people do when they retire from their jobs. You know, well, what are you going to do now? And and there are people who, if they do stop working, they lose their identity because they are so identified by their job. And I, I see how that can happen with athletes all their life. You know, from kids, they've been preparing. All they've done is become athletes. And then there's a point where, and it's fairly young in their life, where it's like, hey, you don't get to be an athlete anymore. But mm -hmm. that's that's all I know. Like the, the it's fascinating to me because I do think that anxiety, anxiety is a real thing. And I try to be as empathetic as I can to people who, who suffer from it, because I know there's a lot of people that it's always like, ah, whatever, get over it. And it's just like it. Have you ever become fixated on something and someone tells you don't think about it? And you're trying your best not to think about it. Don't try to but meditate. All, <laughs> but but all you're doing is thinking about it. I mean, there are people that are like that who literally cannot shut that off. And it, to me, it seems like a horrible way to live your life. And so to have guys like this, and I, I feel like a lot of credit should, to me, I'm sure there was a lot of players before this and before in the particular, but I feel Zank, Zach Granke, should get a lot of credit because for me, I remember as that being the first player who was open about his mental health issues, about his social anxiety, about the fact that, you know, he didn't like talking to people. And I know there's a lot of stories out there about how weird Zach Granke is and how people think he's like a serial killer and all that stuff because oh of the, the, all the interesting uh, concepts and ideas that he comes out with. But, you know, for me, that's the first player that I I remember openly talking about these mental health issues. But I think that's what's important about having these conversations is because a lot of people, I don't want to say suffer, but a lot of people go through this alone or maybe you share it with your friend groups. But it's not something that we particularly used to talk about in, in public. Like I, I am super introverted. I'm very shy. I have social anxiety. Like I'm not, I'm not diagnosed, but I have my own things that I go through. We all have our own crosses to bear and, and we all choose what's worth it to go out in the world and accomplish and what we can do. And, you know, some days what we can't. And the fact that these players are asking for help, I just, I applaud them. Like this, I think this is this is also what gives the game some of its humanity. And and if they need some help or, you know, Chris Martin needs to go on the IL for a little bit of anxiety, then then good for him. And, and I will say this also, Amy, you know, what doesn't help is I don't know if you saw I, I, I sent it to you, so I don't know if you got a chance to read it. But the Athletic put out this article, this anonymous player poll that they mm -hmm. do every year with the most overrated player in baseball. I didn't like, get to, to me, read it, but I saw your list and I was like, this is what we're doing. Not you yeah. sending it to me, but like, wow. I, I mean, it just feels like such clickbait. Like, why do we need this? Why do we need to know who, who players think is overrated? I don't understand what what is positive that can come out of this? Well, and I'm looking at this and it says 59 responses. So this thing's going out to the world and 59 people responded to this, to this list. Like that's it. I, that we're basing it off 59 people and their opinion. But some of the, these players that, that come up on this poll, you know, Chaz Jism, Anthony Rendon. Nope. Ant nope. Nope. Say his name again. Jazz. Not, he said Chaz Jism. Oh. Oh, whoops. I, go back, go back. Thank you. Save you thank from you. Face thank you. Thank you. I, I retract. I retract. <laughs> Look, you uh, hear that, Jose? <laughs> but the thing is, like, Anthony Rendon is a guy who is has been injury plagued the last few years. He won a World Series, and guess what? He was instrumental in beating the Dodgers in that NLCS. Okay. Yes, I can still uh, feel the pain from that. <laughs> you know, say what you will about Carlos Correa. He's hit some big, he's got some big hits against the Dodgers. Uh, like Cody Bellinger, Cody Bellinger is shows up on this poll. Cody Bellinger has won a rookie of the year. He's won an MVP. He had a nice bounce back season for the Cachorros he last year. Turned just, he turned it around. Like I, what is this, this? I guess my question is what does this list accomplish? Exactly. And, and, and my, because it really just comes off as haters. It really just comes off as hating for the sake of, of hating. Be and this is what, again, where I, I say, like, it's hard enough for these guys to be successful. 
they're you don't out think there they're competing. harder on themselves than everybody else and then you you put everybody else on their back but like you don't think like you said to your point austin barnes knows chris taylor knows yeah i wish you guys could see i would uh, look i I, you, I know you're, I, you're saddest christmas ever <laughs> exactly i i know i use this example a lot but for those of you who have not seen noah Syndergaard in person there's a reason why he called them Thor. Okay. The guy is just like almost seven feet, just all muscle. And I was right in front of his face. And I thought he was literally going to break down and cry. And this is a man who you just sit there and you go, oh, he must be really strong. And he looked like he was broken. Well, these and, guys just have the worst game of their life or that day or that week. I won't say their life. And then and then now they've got to face the media. And I know everybody has a job to do. We we are media sometimes. We are also fans. So we get to wear both of those hats. But like it sucks when you know you're going to go talk to a pitcher or a player who had a crummy game. And now so you've got to go get sound bites like it. It is not my favorite thing to do to stand there with the recorder or like try to get footage of these guys hanging their head and having to account to other people for where they messed up when they know we all just saw it, but we got, you know, we got to get those sound bites. And, and I say that as a person on the other side of it too. And it just, it's, it sucks. <laughs> it, it, it does. Will it ever change? I don't know because there are just too many people out there who I do feel lack empathy and but I think I, it also gives everybody a, a look into that humanity, though. Hopefully they can take the humanity side of it and not something like this list of like kind of just I don't know. Just yeah, look, <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's one of those things where Mookie get tested, gets endless amounts of shit because he has other interests other than baseball. He's right. still getting shit for for the shortstop thing. Like, I don't know how many more times him and Dave Roberts can tell the media that shortstop is not impacting him, his offense, whatever. He's an athlete. He's OK playing this like it can. The fact that it continues to be a narrative, whether, you know, it's his personal life bowling outside of it or or this change midseason. Like, what? Do you think this is helping his mental health to continue talking about something that he has clearly said it's not an issue? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Uh, I, look, I I tip my hat to guys like Chris Martin, guys like Matt Kemp, guys who can openly speak about this because hopefully what that does, it makes other people feel comfortable, other players to be able to express you know, how they feel. And maybe with that comes healing. Maybe it helps them be able to uh, cope with whatever their symptoms, whatever their, I don't know what the correct word is for it, but able to, to cope with whatever they're dealing with. Or just and be normalizes it for the rest of us that these guys are human. We're human. We all have our, our foibles, our, our whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I think it was very big of them uh, to do that. So I, I, I want to commend them on that. Um, there were a couple other things that we wanted to cover with the, at the end of the Yankees series. Uh, I know we devoted an episode in terms of what the Dodgers actual needs are as the trade deadline is, is approaching. Um, one of the things that caught my attention in that Yankees series that we didn't get a chance to talk about there, there are two players that I want to run by you here, Amy, and that is Gavin Lux catches a lot of strays uh, on social media, especially with Dodger fans. There are a lot of Dodger fans that seem to be very angry with Gavin Lux in particular with his production. And no matter how many times on this show, we sit there and say, the guy hadn't played baseball in over a year. He's coming off of a major injury. Maybe it's going to go ahead and take time. I know there's a lot of people who don't want to hear that. There are people that are just like, no, dude, this guy's just not good. So why are we wasting time? It's like Look, nobody it, can catch a break because people are saying the same thing about Pajes. And it's like, well, how is he going to get better if you don't give him time to play? <laughs> Yeah, and and I know if you look at Gavin Lux's numbers, they're they're not good. It's it. I mean, he's hitting two sixteen, but he's making progress because there was a point in the season where he was under the Mendoza line. So I know that people are already talking about trades that they they got to get rid of Lux. They got to get rid of Lux, and the Dodgers are going to have to make it because if 
I mean, he had three hits on Sunday night I was against just the say, Yankees. He went three for four. He got three singles on Sunday. Like, if not he, not so great on Friday, but then nobody was hitting in that game, Dodgers or Yankees. So, like, no shade to any of those guys on Friday. Yeah, like he's gonna make it if he keeps like all. What if he goes on a hot streak? Like, what do you do? Because everyone has made up their mind that he's got to go. That he is, he's not a solution to their problem. But if he starts getting hot, you know, what are you going to do there? Another player in terms of that I think is going to play a role when it comes to the trade deadline is Miguel Vargas. And after watching that Yankees series, Amy, what has become very clear to me is he needs to be traded. Uh, because for him to not play in that Yankee series at all, the reason why I, at least I think he didn't play is the Dodgers don't trust him out on the field. And especially in Pittsburgh, and I know he lost a ball in the lights, but his play out in the field has not made me confident that he can play in the outfield. So for me, I think this is a kid who just doesn't have a position. I think the reason why he has the ability to make the major leagues is because of his bat. But we but already have also, a DH. He's also round peg square hole. He didn't, he wasn't really a left fielder. He's an infielder. Yeah. So like, I, you know, I get, I, I like we, we need somebody strong, obviously in that left field position, but to his credit, that's not his natural position. He's, and he's not Mookie Betts who can just, you know, move on the field and he's not a natural utility player. He, you know, so but a Amy, what, what does this tell you when you say outfield is not his natural position, that he's an infielder? There was a period where he played third base in the minor leagues. The Dodgers haven't put him at third base. There's a reason why I don't think the Dodgers put him at third base, and that's because I don't think they trust him at third base. I know I would he rather also have hasn't get. played there in a while. He's only been in the outfield this whole season. So how do you just... I mean, if again, I bring in Mookie, if he's getting this much crap being Mookie bets and he was already going to be slotted in second base. And now we all we've done is move him over to shortstop and people are losing their minds over it. You bring in potentially like an almost rookie and plug him into third base and you guys have had him in left all all year. He's still got to make that transition. Yeah, that to me, he's he's a guy who doesn't have a position. And mm -hmm. because he doesn't have a position, you have to trade him. Now the fact that I think I think other major league ball clubs see this, they they have the Dodgers have no leverage there, so I don't know what they can get from Miguel Vargas. But I think in terms of what's best for Miguel Vargas, I think what's best for Miguel Vargas is for him to go to another organization where he is going to get an opportunity, whether well, it's like as a DA, Michael Bush, any of those other guys that you don't want them languishing in the minors, and if they don't have a spot up on the team and that you can naturally platoon them in. Something's got to give. Yeah. Uh, so that that was for him to not see any action in this Yankees series to me just spoke volumes uh, in terms of how much trust the Dodgers have in him. Uh, that was a big series and they clearly wanted to make a statement. They wanted to to show everybody that they could compete with the Yankees. And so Miguel Vargas was just not a part of those plans. Uh, again, the trade deadline isn't until the end of July. But we are now getting towards the middle of June. So the clock is ticking in terms of the Dodgers are going to have to make a decision and decide what are the areas of need that they have and how are they going to address it? Uh, because I know the name I keep hearing a lot is our old friend Lipschitz. Lipschitz is. I'm sorry, what's his name? Lipschitz. No. Lipschitz is, is tearing. Mm -mm. Oh, that's Try right. Lip, Lipsius. Yes, Lip yes, yes. You don't want Lip me to start calling you Juan. <laughs> <laughs> I was called that all my life. I've been called worse. Yeah. Uh, how much did you like that? <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, he's tearing it up down in the minor leagues, but I like for everybody's like, bring him up, bring him up. I was like, guys, we've seen this before. We've seen guys in the minor leagues tear it up. And then guess what? They show up in the major leagues and it's a different ball game. So, Literally, Mate. it's a show. That, but that's, okay, so we can't, nobody wants to have the veterans because they're getting older. They're aging out. We we only have so many, like, fresh players, if you will. And then you've got to bring up the rookies, but there's going to be an adjustment period, but nobody wants the adjustment period. So what do you do? Well, I, look, if Lipsius really was an option, I think the Dodgers need to consider 
having him come up uh, fairly soon because you want to be able to give that guy enough time to see if he is a solution uh, to your problem. Because again, we still don't know what's going on with Max Muncy, even though I don't know if you, did you see this update that Bruce Dark Gratterall is actually now throwing? He's at Camelback Ranch right now. Yep. So uh, like, like, and it's always hard because you just don't know. But if, if Muncy isn't going to come back or Muncy's going to come back later, and maybe Lipsius can go ahead and spell because, look, defensively, I think Geek is great at third base, but offensively, I it, he's just not the same guy. Uh, and maybe uh, what the Dodgers need, especially in this lineup with its inconsistency, is you know, maybe you try and see what's going on with Lipsius on there. Uh, um, I mean, I'm looking, Kike's numbers weren't bad this weekend. I'm, just, I mean. Okay. What what's the overall numbers look like? Uh I'd have to double check the overall, but if I'm looking at at Friday, like it looks like only well, got on, on an error, but walked, doubled, got on a filter's choice. Just trying to see. Saturday he walked, got a home run. Let's just say that uh, Kike is a little over the Mendoza line. And that's the issue I think is you have Lux who is over the Mendoza line. Uh, but I, mean, I think it also depends for each of these players. Okay. Yes. They're, o they're a little over the Mendoza line, but how, how have they been trending say in the last 30 days? The last, you know, is it, have they heated up in the last X amount of games or has it been consistently flat the entire season? And I don't think that can be said for the majority of the guys. These guys all have, they've gotten hot. They've cooled off a little bit. That's all of them. Like Pajes, Kike, Hayward, they all go in fits and starts Lux. So, I mean, if you're going to hold them to the, the actual batting average, I know we're using that as a measurement, but we also have to look, okay, currently what's going on too, versus what's, what's been happening the entire season. All point, everything points to what all the beat writers tell me when I'm at the stadium, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the postseason one. And if these guys end up, doing what they normally do in the postseason, it's it's going to be a rough off season. So that's what sucks is we're sitting here talking about this and trying to give today urgency when in the end, all we care about is the finish line. That's, that's not me. All. I'm, I'm game at a timing this. I'm like, all right, cool. We got a game tomorrow. We got Joe Kelly Jersey night tomorrow. We've got a whole bunch of games. We got the, the Texas Rangers coming into town. I'm excited for the next game. If we make it to October, and odds are we probably will, we'll tackle that when we get to October. What What right, are you so going to do? You going to time travel forward? Check it out. Come back. I, I may I may get in my DeLorean. Okay. I may, you All right. don't know. You All don't right. know. I'll There's meet you there in my little Wayne's World. Doo -doo 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 -doo. There's a reason why I walk around with plutonium. Okay. Uh, All right. So That's before awesome. we before we wrap things up, I do want to hear about your adventures with Saber. And I'm not referring to Kathy Bates's company in the office, but uh, <laughs> go ahead and let me know. Uh, uh, let the people know about Sabre for, for those new nerds that we have listening or watching the show. So for any of you who it's, it's the society uh, for American baseball research. They recently just had the Jerry Malloy Negro league conference. Um, Sabre has been around since 1971. I recently learned from this conference that they, they were actually created because the baseball hall of fame was having some fits and starts with getting some of the Negro league players in. So they decided to create their, their own organization. Um, the whole idea behind whether it's the Negro leagues, uh, you know, promoting activities, enhancing scholarly, educational, and literary, literary ob objectives, or just being a fan research place to go. We have people across the board, people who are doing research. We have the MLB historian who is a member. And then there's just a bunch of people that are fans. Um, some of the it's, it's worldwide 7,500 members. Um, it's just, they, they have all kinds of stuff. The, the objective is to get fans to talk to like-minded people and just talk about baseball. And some of the stuff that came up this weekend was, 
even just from a general perspective, most of the members are more of the older generation. They reflect the demographic that we typically see in baseball. And so they need younger people to carry the torch of this, of, of the history, of the love of the game. So whether you love research, if you just like facts, they have really cool like biographies and, and picture, like just a whole picture library. Like there's just so much that's cool about about this. And so you can run the gamut of if you're a nerd who likes numbers or, you know what, I just like reading a cool bio here and there. Um, but this weekend was the, uh, the, as I mentioned, the Jerry Malloy uh, Negro League convention. It happened in Cooperstown. They did have a virtual option, which is how I was able to attend. But they had a lot of really great talks, stuff on Josh Gibson. Um, they even said, like, there was some controversial stuff where, um, basically from the Kansas City Monarchs, like Shohei Otani isn't the first like two-way player. Like there were people doing it back then. John Donaldson was a center fielder and a pitcher. Same thing for Bullet Rogan, Jose Mendez. So like all of these things that we see like trends in baseball, it was just people talking about that. Um, they were talking about the value of even just cards and memorabilia. I didn't realize that Josh Gibson only had two game used bats that were that were kind of like circling around out there. Uh, Christie's recently sold one for three hundred and sixty thousand. Uh, the Josh Gibson's family sold the other one to Tops, who chopped it up and sold it as part of pieces of baseball cards. Um, had a very spirited debate with my best friend. She's on the board of like, cause her husband, you know, collects baseball cards. Hey, if this is the only way I'm going to get a piece of a Jersey or a baseball bat, like more power to tops for like chopping it up. And I'm like, but that was Josh Gibson's bat. So just really, really cool stuff. Um, it, if you guys are interested in things like that, happy to talk about it, but really it just, I don't know a lot of the conference itself was like embracing and understanding the history beyond just Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier. A lot of it focused on like he reintegrated the sport because at the turn of the century, we did have players playing, you know, black, white. We even had some of the, the first like Latino born players. I think it was Luis Castro. So it was just really cool to see all of that history come together and people talking about it. So I will now end my Sabre platform, but if you have a love and passion for baseball or history, Sabres is the place to check out. Oh, that's awesome. That, that is awesome. Uh, so that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, any last words before we wrap things up, Amy? No, I love history and baseball. Yay. <laughs> Nerd alert. <laughs> uh, for those of you listening on the audio portion, please make sure you are subscribed to our podcast. Uh, you know, rate us, write us a review, help spread the word. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. Hit that notification button. Give us a thumbs up. Leave us comments. We love engaging with you guys. And if you're make sure you're following us on social media on X at BB Shangri LA on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch at Baseball Shangri LA. She is Amy Cuevas. I am Juan Ramirez. Nos despedimos con un beso. Amy, say goodbye to the people. Goodbye, people. <laughs>